I think it's a hard question for me because I'm not like specialist in technical matters, but um, some of researchers who are dealing with this fresco from Famagusta, they um, like describe it as synopia, like the technique of um, like some some kind of engraving on the on, on the plaster. So so maybe it's that that is not really a, a fresco, but I I I. I I'm not sure if I agree with that because uh, because there are some traces of also from um, you know. Um, of course, it's a it's a possibility. It's a possibility that it's not finished because we know, for example, in Georgian Church of Chalangika, which was also decorated in the 14th century by Byzantine. Um, Byzantine artists. There is a fresco depicting. I don't know if I. It's on the. Um, it, it's it's on uh, it's on the north wall near the entrance and depicting. I think Holy Supper, but um, but the, the, you can see on the fresco that some parts are um, already painted and some are left like only the engraving. So we can just like see that there are like the parts which weren't finished by the artist. So maybe it was the case in Fama states. It's really hard to, to answer to that because um, this fresco was um, it, it was um, fi found um, under they removed the minbar so so that's why it's it preserved in the church because it was behind the minbar so so only the small fragment preserved and in the whole church we have only two two or three more remains small remains of, of other paintings so so I think it's it's hard to to answer that but we have like um, a, a depiction of two hallowed figures, like um, they were interpreted by uh, Professor Bacci as, as like a fragment of a scene of, um, for, 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 from the Getsemani garden. But um, this, um, these figures are already painted. We can, we can trace color there, they are typical frescoes. So, so we have like, um, we know that in the church, there were other decorations, there were other painted decorations which were finished. So it, it's not like they started only this one fresco and they, 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 they left it unfinished. I don't know if I could answer your question. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Maria. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, there are two, I have two iconographic <laughs> concerns. Uh, I think in order to make your argument more convincing, we need to be able to find parallel. First of all, uh, two figures are shown praying. Uh, I am not aware of any representations of dumb and hell praying with their hands raised. So if you want to uh, strengthen your argument, uh, this the posture of the figures is very important because usually we have the dark suffering and there are suffering figures, but not praying. They are in hell. They are not, we don't have the dark praying in hell. So you will need, in order to make your argument more convincing, uh, look into that. There might be, uh, I mean, I never knew. I didn't know that the dump in hell could be pressed and we found the parallel intentionally. So you might as well look for parallel. And the other thing, again, in the, in the Famagusta fresco, one of the figures supports the other. Again, in, uh, in the representations of the dump, they don't help each other, they are the dump. They are suffering. So again, this is this is a, an image that we find in representations of both martyrs. They are a group. They support each other. But the damned in hell do not support each other, as far as I know. So these two 
postures, very specific postures. And in order to pursue your, you, you need to uh, take them into account and try to explain what they are doing in a representation of the dog. Okay, because these, these are very, um, if you can find parallels, comparisons, it will strengthen your argument. Otherwise, uh, it is problematic. Of course, okay. of course, thank you for planning. So I think it's a great uh, like okay. way of, uh, of seeking more because, um, as far as I remember, I I know one one painting uh, with when we see like in the the picture on the band where there are two figures which holding helping each other. But I I I have to check it. But because of, yes, thank you very much. It's a it's a great comment. Do you want? To say? I also want to comment on the. Uh, the bending over figure and the guy who's sitting and the cover uh, uh, But I, I took it on the in painting, like 15th century painters who wanted to do it, for example. Uh, the dam are not helping each other, they are basically pulling each other to more skill. So they have to take the bike and, you know, turn the landish thing. Talk about the bike. Uh, it's a long, uh, also, piece. So what you Figures that are something in spell and they're trying to catch on to the mates that are next to them and they're pulling them together into hell. So um, I, I've never seen anyone helping each other. Um, it's just uh, the monkey that they have to do. It's because it's like I think that in, in Western Europe, this iconography of, of the event is really more like. Expressing because there are like lots of figures like pulling each other, also impressed by Giotto in, uh, or, or some, some, some other examples. But I think that in, in Byzantine art, this, this motif is they are really, I think that maybe this fresco from the Chan, it was um, we could like um, see that this, um, these um, characters which are depicted in the scene of the outer darkness they are like standing really calmly because they are then. They are covered with this with this darkness, but they are they get sure they pose are really calm because the other group that's which were identified with the one that sleep with not, they were like in and this entangled to like uh positions, but but the the other group was really calm. So so I think that the the variation from the Western iconography can be can be found there. But of course I think it's it's a case which should be expanded. So so thank you for this. Anyone else? So, uh, since it's uh, almost three o'clock, uh, uh, thanks to all three uh, presenters. I want, to hear, I want your attention. It will follow a break of uh, 40 minutes. Uh, a long poster presentation on the first floor of the building. And we resume again at uh, uh, three four uh, three uh, twenty five. Thank you. I'd like to remind everyone that if anyone from the room has questions for the online presenters, 10 minutes before the next session, just come downstairs and ask the questions to the people waiting in line. Thank you.
Hello, everybody. Um, uh, for the people here, for the people online, I just wanted to uh, ask if there are any questions or comments or remarks uh, on the posters. If not, <laughs> uh, uh, if we don't have anything, we can move on to our uh, next session or uh, ask questions later. So, yeah, I'm giving the floor to the first person, chat person. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. It's the uh, second afternoon uh, session of the FORMAC uh, conference. Many congratulations to the organizers for the very successful conference today. And uh, this session is entitled Ritual, Burial Practices and Funerary Beliefs. And our first speaker is Amy Ferguson. She is an MA student at the University of Wales. The subject is Object Analysis of the Early Bronze Age Cochatis Shrine Model. Does this model depict ritual or religious action within an ancient Cypriot heterotopia? Amy, are you here with us? Yes, I'm here. I just need to share my screen. Yes, please. Hello, the floor is yours. Prepare the screen. Can everyone see it? Yeah, yes. All right, so good afternoon. And for my presentation today, I will be doing an object analysis of the Kachati Shrine model, which is the object I am looking at for my MA dissertation. So the Kachati's model is from the early Bronze Age, but without any clear provenance. Uh, it could potentially come from anywhere north slash northeast of the Trudos Mountains. However, in the literature, there is an assumption that it likely came from a, the settlement of Marquis, with Webb and Frankel alluding to it coming from somewhere closer to the North Coast in their Ritual Cosmologies and Social Strategies article from 2010. So I've mentioned this was early Bronze Age, so the approximate dates for the model are between 2600 BC to 2000 BC. So this is comfortably situated in the Bronze Age as well as the early Cypriot 1C period and early Cypriot 2 period. Regardless, this material definitively follows on from the reintroduction of cattle on the island. And so from this article, I got to familiarize myself with the object, albeit from one image. And what drew me to the model initially was its striking composition, as it channels the artistic endeavors of plank figurines whilst displaying these three bovine figures upright in a tripartite facade, which is an architectural feature that usually consists of three archways with all at the same height or with the central figure slightly elevated, um, which we can see here. Our central bowl is just slightly larger than the other two. So keeping focus on these three figures, what I find in the literature is there is a hesit hesitancy to approach them and they're often grouped together as one entity. But we can see that the figure on our left is not a bullheaded figure and is rather a different ruminant animal, most likely a indeterminate species of caprid. Um, however, it is hard to determine as the horns have suffered um, damage over time, the tips have been broken off, unfortunately. Um, aside from this, the model is well-preserved and due to its level of preservation, the model is assumed to have come from a burial context and alongside the idea that this came from the North Coast, I feel it's important to mention a statistic from 
Daisy Knox's PhD on the figurative material of Cyprus, as she found a huge bias for cattle in the zoomorphic figurines from North Coast burials, with 54% of the animals depicted being cattle, um, which is a key part of the aesthetic identity from the North Coast that continues to develop throughout the Bronze Age and spread further across the island. Although she states a lack of settlement activations means there is no comparative record for this bias. And what I like about these three figures is the idea of power dynamics as they have individual pilasters but are unified with a horizontal pilaster across the back panel of the model. And so if this was a tangible space, possibly a shrine, it would be a very significant undertaking in terms of resources and architectural needs. Um, it's also worth mentioning that the figures exude a strong, quite masculine presence over the scene. As female bovids and caprids can have horns, but they are significantly smaller. And so if this is the case, I find it a nice juxtaposition to the rather isolated and exposed figure below, um, where on the model's base, you can see the space is also quite enclosed around our little figure and is not as open or as spacious as this kind of back panel. Um, regardless, all the subjects are interacting within the scene and in a very intimate proximity to each other. So moving on to the base of the model, we have an interesting setup with a small female figure just slightly left of the centre facing a rather large vessel. And it's rather large relative to her stature, not the bullheaded figures. Um, and so her facial features are hard to see because she's not normally photographed and the facial features are rather gender ambiguous. However, the gesture of the outstretched arms and the presence of really small little lumps of clay in the chest region are indicative that this female, uh, this figure is female. So there are also some incised lines around the figure's neck that don't get any attention. They've not been looked at in terms of body modification, dress or scarification. And so hopefully if I get to um, take my own photos of this model at some point in the near future, this is something I would like to look into further and hopefully get clearer images of because the model is normally photographed from this direction so that we can face this tripartite and we're assuming that this is how we're meant to face it. But it means that our view of the female figure is rather limited and, you know, it's not necessary that we have to face these bullheaded figures. It might be better for us to place it sideways so we can face her, um, which is something that me and my um, lecturers, fellow students talk about is, you know, how we're meant to view this. Um, so the relationship with the vessel is something I first noticed as an undergraduate student and its similarities to burial practices. So ideas of offering, uh, veneration, guardianship. So tombs at Bella Pasvunus have jars raised in front of the Stomion part of tombs. So it would be situated in the dromos, which acts as the entryway to the tomb. And so I have mentioned in my title, heterotopia. So in terms of heterotopia, a dromos could be seen as a false space or one that precedes a more significant space. So a modern comparison for this would be a porch outside of a house. And depending on your actions, in the porchway determines whether or not you're welcome into the more private space of the home. And so let me just move my slide. Here we go on to um, heterotopias. So this is the theoretical approach that I want to take in using uh, to analyze the object. So heterotopia translates to other space. 
And when I was first introduced to it, it was from the geographical interpretation that this was a real tangible space. However, it originates in philosophy, uh, specifically in philosophies of Foucault, who first used this idea to oppose the idea of utopias, something that is very commonly discussed in um, philosophy. And he uses this and progresses it um, to kind of explore the creation and development of spaces. And the concept of heterotopia develops six uh, principles, which I cannot sufficiently describe within a small presentation. So it can best be summarized as a floating piece of space, a place without a place that exists by itself. And so I began to question whether this scene is taking place within a heterotopia. These spaces exist within every human group. So Foucault um, adamantly argues that no culture can escape making uh, heterotopias. And he claimed that they require different behaviors to kind of mundane spaces and routines of daily life and practices because they function Outside of this, this is why I believe it's applicable to the Kachatis model. And as I do not see the action depicted in the model as a daily occurrence. Here on this slide, I've also included a picture of the Venus bowl, as although this is later and more complex material, it demonstrates social exclusion, which with this figure clinging to the wall, next to the kind of open and accessible gateway inside into the inside of the model. So similar to the Kachati's model, the space it takes place in looks open and accessible, and yet there is only one figure within it, which does not discount the participation and involvement of the three um, horned figures. However, there is they're almost acting as the boundary or threshold of the space. And so, because this is a very kind of visual object and you need to see more of the space, I have some more images of the model from different angles to see, to show you that something I haven't mentioned was on the front of the models, we have these little hooks coming through the back panel that also continue on, uh, onto the back of the model as well. You know, it shows this continuation of space. So if this was, if they are acting as a threshold or a boundary, then why has the craftsman chosen to um, accentuate the clay through to the other side to show, you know, what is that saying? And does this show that the space carries on and we're merely facing one part of the space and we have to do something to pass through it to, have access to this further additional space behind what the tripartite is showing. And I think the ideas of offering and veneration are extremely applicable here because we have this little figure standing with a, with a vessel and whatever type of vessel this was or whatever was in the vessel, it's significant and large in comparison to her. So if this is to scale, you know, this would be um, quite a huge um, offering, I think. And what I find interesting is, you know, the idea of, is this a permanent setup or feature in the space? Or has this female taken the vessel into the space? And another aspect of heterotopias is kind of, uh, cleansing of spaces and contamination of spaces. So perhaps that's why there is this boundary or threshold being shown, you know, to limit your access to the beyond space or perhaps an intangible space. You have to behave in a certain way or do something first to get the access to it. And I have no kind of conclusive answers on this, but this is something that, you know, I want to spend the next year 
researching further to see if I can get any more kind of concrete ideas from this. Um, perhaps figuring out what type of vessel this was so we can say with some certainty what was what it was being used for or what was inside of it. Because as you can kind of see in the model, you know, there is a little dip in the vessel to show, you know, um, that it had depth, something would have been in it and it was um, uh, usable. So, yeah, I think that's <laughs> all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. So we move to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Elisabeth Stefani. Elisabeth is here. Elisabeth, can you please? Nakut. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Hello. I just need some help. I will start my video and then share my screen, right? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hello, everyone. A second, there is an issue with the camera, I guess. Can you see me? Hello, Elizabeth. Yes, Dr. Elizabeth Stefani from the Department of Antiquities of Cyprus. She will present us her topic on the necropolis of Amathus, mortuary topography, funerary architecture, and burial practices during the first millennium BC. The floor is yours, Elizabeth. <laughs> Yes, I'm just trying to share my yes. screen now. Yes, and we are waiting. There. But I have to go back and find the first. Sorry. Just a second, I'll try again. Share screen. Can you see it? Yes, put it in full mode. Yes, here we are, right? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Hello, everyone. I would like, first of all, to thank the organizers of this meeting for inviting me here today. The topic of my presentation is related to my PhD research, which was undertaken in the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Cyprus under the supervision of Professor Maria Yagobu. My research focused on the analysis of the mortuary topography and the study of the funerary architecture in Amathus from the early Iron Age to late antiquity. To present a long-term research in 15 minutes is quite a challenge, but I will try to immerse you in the Amathusian funerary landscape while sticking to the allotted speaking town. The burial uh, grounds of Amathus extended on the hills surrounding the Animos Hill and have been conventionally named after the spatial correlation as Eastern, Northern and Western necropolis. The three necropolis suffered severe damage as they have been the target of looting for many years, especially during the 19th century. Many antique dealers and foreign officials were provided with artifacts deriving from cemeteries of Amathus, which were illegally excavated by walkers and nearby villagers. The most elaborate and precious artifacts would later be displayed in various museums around the world. The first large-scale excavations at Amathus were, were conducted by the British Museum in 1893-94, and the necropolis were the first to be explored because of their reputation as treasured field sites. The auspicious signs were partly due to the previous activities of Chesnola, who in 1874 saw and investigated hundreds of tombs cut in the rock, the greatest abundance of which is found along the seashore. The Swedish Cyprus expedition conducted the first scientific archaeological research in the Western Necropolis in 1930. The majority of the tombs was investigated by the Department of Antiquities following the rapid growth of construction in the area. The land development of the Limassol East Coast was the result of the influx of refugees after the 1974 invasion. The 10 kilometer coastal zone expanding from Ayostihonas to the Limassol city center has been extensively developing since the 1980s with the construction of new hotels, commercial, office and residential buildings. The area where the two coastal necropolis were situated 
was swiftly developed and the landscape changed drastically the past four decades. The rescue excavations conducted by the Department of Antiquities in the areas affected by the development have brought to light more than a thousand tombs until today, which are distributed in the three necropolises as follows. 531 in the western, 22 in the northern, and 364 in the eastern necropolis. The western and eastern necropolis extend on the lower parts of the south facing slopes of the Animos and Vicles Hill, respectively. The greatest amount of the tombs is oriented towards the sea, with the entrance facing south, southwest, or southeast without a specific distribution pattern. The northern necropolis extends on the lower hillock to the northeast of the Acropolis Hill, as well as on the southern and eastern slope of the Muchas Hill to the north. The torrents descending from the north delimit the two coastal cemeteries serving as borders. The majority of the earliest burials are found in the western necropolis, where 10 tombs dated to the late cyprogeometric one or to the transition to the cyprogeometric two are spread over an area that extends 400 meters on an east-west axis. At least one cyprogeometric tomb is also found in the eastern and northern necropolis, suggesting their burial used during these early phases. The number of the tomb rises during the cyprogeometric two in all the three burial grounds. The Western Necropolis is extensively used, containing 80% of the tombs. The 51 cyprogeometric two tombs indicate the existence of a designed and well-organized burial ground, which now extends to an 800-meter-long area. In the Northern Necropolis, the three tombs are dated to the cyprogeometric two, providing evidence for the extension of the burial ground in a 700-meter-long area on the north-south axis. The tombs of the eastern necropolis are concentrated to its southeastern limit at the coastal locality of Lures, one kilometer east of the Acropolis or Castro's Hill. During the cyprogeometric three, three, a greater increase in the number of new tombs is noted. The majority of the tombs are still located in the western necropolis, which now extends to an area of 900 meters long. New tombs were also constructed in the northern necropolis, while at the eastern necropolis, the tombs are still concentrated at the Lure site. The greatest number of the tombs excavated at Amathus are dated to the Cyprochaic one, with 455 tombs having been registered at the three, necro at the three cemeteries. During this period, the western necropolis presents the most extensive use with the highest density of tombs. The number of the Cyprochaic one tombs at the northern necropolis is very small and they are located to the northeast of the Acropolis, while some earlier tombs near Agios Tijonas were reused. A sharp increase in the number of new graves is attested in the eastern necropolis, implying they are spread over the southern and southeastern slope of the Vicles Hill. A slight decrease in the number of the graves has been registered during the Cyprochaic II period. The density and distribution of the tombs is very similar to that of the preceded one. During the Cyproclastica period, the number of the tombs in use decreases slightly. The majority of the tombs are now located in the eastern necropolis, changing the picture so far, according to which the largest number of tombs were located in the western necropolis. In the western necropolis, there is a noticeable decrease in the number of new tombs. The eastern necropolis presents now the largest concentration of tombs. During the Hellenistic times, the practice of reusing tomb is prevalent since the number of the new tombs decreases even more. The limits of the western necropolis are extended to the west in the north, while in the northern necropolis, the burials are concentrated to the north of the defensive walls and on the southern slope of the Mutas Hill. In the eastern necropolis, new tombs are built between the earlier ones throughout the necropolis. The number of the tombs in use presents again a small increase during the Roman times. Reused tombs encounter throughout the western necropolis. In the eastern necropolis, re the reused tombs are found on the southern and southeastern slopes of the Vicles Hill, while the new graves are located on the western slope of the hill. Regarding the funerary architecture, six main tomb types have been distinguished in the Amathusian burial grounds. The chronological range of the tomb types is characterized by a diachronic use as the vast majority of them were used for multiple burials over a long period of time. The commonest time of tomb in Amathus, as in the rest of the island, is the rock cut chamber type, a tomb. The 567 rock cut chamber tombs constitute 60% of the investigated tombs. This tomb time is in use from the earliest phases of the cyprogeometric until the late Roman period. 
The funerary chambers were cut into the natural bedrock and the access to their interior was provided through a vertical shaft or a short sloping dromos. The shaft tombs comprise the second largest tomb type of tombs in Amathus. 143 tombs are assigned to this type, of which 26 belong to a distinct category of which the chambers are lined with walls built in cobalt vault technique. The construction of the, of the vertically rock-cut chamber tombs is a local phenomenon without exact parallels on the island. The greatest majority of the shaft tombs are located in the western necropolis, and they firstly appeared in the late Cyprogeometric one. Their number increases during the Cyprogeometric two and three periods, while their construction terminates in Cyprochaic two. The elaborate version of the shaft tombs lined with built walls are the earliest monumental funerary constructions of the Iron Age on the island. The built tombs, which are also known as royal tombs, comprise the third tomb type. More than 10 royal tombs have been excavated in the three necropolis. These are monumental underground structures, the construction of which required, apart from building expertise, the expenditure of enormous energy. The conception of the idea for the construction of the royal built tombs and its implementation is not just an architectural achievement, but also constitutes clear expressions of political and economic power with ideological connotations. The royal built tombs date back to the Cypriot cake with repeated reuse in the following periods. Another type of tomb are the cis tombs or mnimata. The cis tombs are the simplest form of graves excavated directly in the earth or cut into the bedrock. Although the recorded examples of these tombs are only seven, it is known that there were much more that have not been recorded or adequately excavated. The majority of the cis tombs were found in the eastern necropolis, distributed among other types of tombs. The type of the above ground or partly above ground built burial structures is represented by a very small number of examples found exclusively in the eastern necropolis. These burial structures found in a poor state of preservation included built arcosolia and rock cut burial pits on their floors. Their superstructure, the entrances and the dromoi were not preserved, rendering it more difficult to reconstruct their original form. Due to the absence of sufficient archaeological material, their dating to the late Roman period is based only on their architectural features. The last tomb type includes tombs with an architectural peculiarity. These are simple rock cut pits containing cremation urns. Only three tombs of this type were recorded and they are all located in the western necropolis. Two of them date to the Cyproclassical period and the third one, which was geographically isolated at the western limit of the necropolis, was covered with an artificial mound and dates to the Hellenistic times. Regarding the burial practices, based on the available excavation data, the following, pra the following practices regarding the treatment of the dead body are documented. Primary inhumations, secondary burials and cremation burials. Inhumation was the most common burial practice, while due to the repeated use of the tombs, the secondary burials are also very common. The evidence for the practice of cremation is very scarce, and it is only attested in the Western necropolis in a very low percentage. The scarcity of, well, of the well-preserved skeletal remains and their insufficient anthropological study do not allow us to draw safe conclusions regarding uh, the analysis of the tomb's demographic structure. Despite the scarcity of the anthropological data, we do know that people of different ages and sexes were buried in the same tombs, while multiple burials on the floor and in successive layers are recorded. The practice of reusing the tombs for several generations or even centuries appears in the Cyprogeometric II period and is particularly intensified from the Cyprochaic onwards. The practice of removing the skeletal remains and placing them in large amphorae e is first documented in Amathus in Cyprogeometric II and continues into Cyprochaic I period. The use of stone sarcophagi seems to have been common in Amathus while they were used from the end of the Cyprochaic until the Roman times. An undetermined number of sarcophagi have been recorded in at least 44 tombs, while it is certain that many more would have been used in other tombs, the traces of which have not been preserved. The commonest type of sarcophagus encountered in Amathus consists of a limestone rectangular coffin resting on four massive feet and a carved or gobbled lid. Anthropoid sarcophagi 
comprise a special category, examples of which were found in the coastal polities of Kirion and Damatus. This type of sarcophagus has par partially a human form with the face, arms, and feet represented in relief and decorated with paint. They are dated between the 5th and 3rd centuries BC and are found throughout the Mediterranean with the, with the majority recorded on the Syro-Palestinian coast. Four anthropoid sarcophagi were found in Amathus, two of which are made of pie and marble, while the other two are of limestone. The practice of cremation was particularly rare in Cyprus throughout antiquity. In Amathus, cremation burials were recorded in nine tombs on the western necropolis. The cremation burials in the chamber tombs coincided with inhumations. The parallel practice of inhumation and cremation burials suggests that the burial practice was chosen by the people who lived at the same time and were probably connected by family ties. The choice of one burial practice over another could be attributed to specific beliefs and ideologies about death, but not necessarily to ethnic groups. The cremation burials, however, seem to be associated with a higher ranking individuals as they involve various and complicated stages. The discovery of a distinct site with exclusive cremation burials within the Western necropolis has led to various assumptions regarding the character of the funerary rituals that took place there. At the coastal site, in this, western, in this western part of the western necropolis, hundreds of cremationers were discovered, deposited in shallow pits, carved into the bedrock, or in the compact sandy soil. The anthropological study of a small portion of them revealed that the vessels contained either exclusively cremated bones or one of one or more individuals, or mixed human with animal bones, and more rarely, only animal bones. The cremated bones were, in a, were found in a very good state of preservation, suggesting the particularly careful process of collecting and placing them in the urns immediately after the cremation. During the funeral, rituals, burial gifts were offered to the deceased in order to accompany them on their journey to the afterlife. The most common burial gifts are the clay vessels, which, based on their typological distinction, are the chronological markers of the burials. Terracotta figurines are also often found in the tombs, and they seem to have played an important role in the funeral ritual. Toiletry, jewelry made of, from precious stones and metals, amulets, coins, and other metal and bone artifacts were also deposited in the tombs. In the burials of, of the Cyprogeometric period, iron and bronze weapons, bronze vessels, as well as other status symbols such as bronze scepters, are often found among the gifts. Within the Amathusian funerary assemblages, the first imported Aegean pottery of the Iron Age were documented. These imports derive from Euboea and date back to the 10th century BC. The majority of the Aegean geometric imports were, of imports were also found in Amathus. Numerous pottery imports from the Palestinian coast also encounter within the Cyprogeometric funerary assemblages, while locally produced vases imitating both imported Aegean and Phoenician prototypes appear from the early phases. One of the most significant conclusions drawn from the examination of the funerary landscape of Amathus is the stability of its burial topography. The choice for the burial use of the sites adjacent to the hill of the Acropolis was conscious and successful. The longevity of the burial character of the three necropolis constitutes a phenomenon of which no clear parallels have been documented in other sites so far. The stability of the burial topography is undoubtedly related to the stability of the urban center of, of Amathus. After the abolition of the independent polities at the end of the 4th century BC, the urban landscape of Amathus remains unaltered. The administrative, social, and religious activities during the Hellenistic and Roman periods are still carried out in the same or in new adjacent areas in the Acropolis and in the lower city, which, for, which from the Cyprocaic period onwards were surrounded by defensive walls. The stability is also associated with an equally stable identity of the social groups of the Amathusians who do not distance this, themselves from their ancestral burial grounds despite any political or economic crisis. The choice of the hills exclusively for burial use and their persistent pres preservation for more than a millennium is also related to the process of the tomb construction and the geomorphology of the area. The sloping surfaces of the soft bedrock were suitable for the carving and the construction of the various types of the underground tombs. The establishment of three distinct burial grounds hints to the existence of residential nuclei that were in all probability founded by different unrelated groups in order to serve the needs associated with an operation of the port of coal. 
The existence of a port from the early stages of Amazon's foundation is regarded essential and granted, although no remains of it have been found. The first port is in the form of a natural lagoon served as an anchorage where ships were protected from the strong westerly winds. The, this port was probably in direct contact with the Acropolis and was silted and blocked after the construction of the outer harbour of Amathus, which is dated to the very beginning of the Hellenistic period. The earliest tombs are the only evidence for the first foundation episode of Amathus, in which no prehistoric evidence is found. In closing, we see that through the examination of the Acropolis, the, the cities of the dead, we can redefine the history of the living. The overall examination of the evidence from the three necropolis has begun to unravel the thread of the history of Amathus, the end of which lies in the study of the earliest tombs and their burial assemblages. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. You will join us afterwards for the discussion. And we will move to our next uh, speaker, Odysseus uh, Boat, PhD candidate, Odyssea, hello, uh, from hello. the University of uh, Paris 1. Uh, his topic is on Archer in Mycenae sub graves. The floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So first, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this event. And today I will present my work on the stone arrowheads from Mycenae and the very first hypothesis I made, focusing on the napping processes and how I use it to question the representation of archery and maybe archers in the particular funerary context of the shaft graves. Before I begin, I would like to give a brief presentation of my research, which deals with archery in mainland Greece during the Mesohelladic and Mycenaean periods. Through this subject, I try to understand the evolution that occurred during the second millennium in mainland Greece through the practice of archery and the role of archers within these societies. To do so, I have based my research on a technological and functional study of stone arrowheads and on the functional study of bronze arrowheads. These artifacts in stone or metal offer an interesting object of study concerning the question of cohabitation of two so specific materials. I have also taken into account the raw texts and iconography that may relate to archery. Finally, I have relied on comparisons with other archaeological and ethnographic contexts. This presentation will focus on a part of my PhD work and my master's degree by focusing on a period, the transition between Middle and Late Helladic, and a site, Mycenae. I will focus on the period of emergence of the Mycenaean tradition, which is marked by profound changes within the society and notably the demarcation of an elite, which is strongly observed at Mycenae and notably in the two grave circles. The burial deposits of the shaft grave uh, consist of a very large accumulation of grave goods from the whole region. Within these graves, only three will interest us today. In, gra in grave circle B, the oldest one, arrowheads were discovered in the shaft graves Delta and Lambda and are associated with three individuals. In grave circle A, only the excavation of grave four led to the discovery of arrowheads but also object with representation of archers. But it cannot be related to any specific individual. The majority of these projectile points are made of stone, with 48 made of flint, 36 of obsidian, and only two of bronze. Today, I will focus on the stone one. And to understand the chain operatoire of these arrowheads, I will begin with the study of raw material, which is here based only on a macroscopic observations. Without going into detail, it is possible to observe a form of continuity of supply throughout the whole shaft grave era. Obsidian from Milos continues to be used throughout the whole Bronze Age at Mycenae. 
A continuity of fin supplying can also be observed throughout the period with two raw materials, the red and green flints. But a new phenomenon is observed in grade four with more varied raw materials and a potential accumulation of regional and extra-regional flints. A similar pattern can be observed regarding the morphology of the arrowheads. They have various shapes that can be divided into several types. The sets in the grave circle B are quite homogeneous. Again, in circle A, the arrowheads of grade four are more varied in form. The morphological change of the arrowheads can be explained in several ways. It is possible to see a chronological evolution, but also to consider different production goals linked to particular activities as hunting or war. We must also question the homogeneity of the production of these artifacts. In the case of the grave lambda, for example, a production with a specific purpose or made by the same mapper and over a short time may justify these homogeneities. In the case of grave four, deposits may, may have been made over a long period, but may also have been representative of several activities. The dimension of the arrowheads vary, especially in terms of length and width. On the other hand, the bases are very standardized for each type. Moreover, the napper seems to have tried to refine those artifacts as much as possible over time. They become thinner and thinner between the oldest one from grave delta and those from grave four. This thinness is emphasized and always reached two millimeter for a particular type of arrowheads present in the grave four and which is found in other contemporary or more recent tombs I believe this is the first or one of the first occurrences of this Mycenaean type of arrowheads in red here. I will focus now on this thinness, which marks an important evolution of, for the arrowheads of this period and seems to become an essential feature for the nappers. A great technical mastery seems necessary to reach this level of thinness, and the nappers must take necessarily a significant risk. This choice forces either to keep a perfect biconvexity or to focus on one convex face with a flat face on the other side. In both cases, it seems to me that we can consider that we are dealing with nappers who master their skills and the napping rhythm in order to maintain a balance between the two faces of the bifacial arrowheads. Several actual nappers have tried to reproduce Mycenaean arrowheads. The difficulty of refining comes up again and again in their comments. The experimental projectile points have for the moment reached at best three millimeters, and there is still a margin to reach the fineness of Mycenaean craftsmen. In addition to the technique and gestures used during the retouch phases, tools can play an important role in the success of this production. I therefore began to conduct an experiment to distinguish between the use of deer antler tools and metal ones in copper or bronze for the period I study. For this purpose, the arrowheads are reproduced each time using a unique material for the tools. The aim is to see what they produce on a nanometric scale by studying the topography of the negative of removals. I made silicon prints both on archaeological and experiment, uh, on, on experimental arrowhead for this. And these prints are studying in collaboration with the Laboratory of Tribology of the Ecole Centrale de Lyon. This experiment is being carried uh, out on arrowheads, but if the results are conclusive, it could be extending to the rest of the lithic industry. For the moment, I can say that the Mycenaean craftsmen put a lot of effort into the production of arrowheads and apply techniques that requires a great amount of skill. The choice to exacerbate the thinness of the projectile points can be associated with maximum risk taking in the context of this production. I therefore propose to associate arrowheads with the rest of the exceptional production present in the grave circles, whether it be weapons or goldsmith work. As I said earlier, the stone arrowheads are both part of an accumulation process when they are present, but also carry the image of the wire hunter that seems to be valued in the shaped graves. The multiplicity of weapon deposited 
have, has been associated with wires panoplies. The question here is whether the deposits of arrays complete these sets or represent an additional facet associated here with archery. The iconography offers us a first view of the representation of archery in this period. In Chef the Great Four, two images show the practice of bow hunting, which is also documented in other seals, while the other two show military conflicts. Without discussing the possible influences and artistic exchanges concerning these motifs, these representations testify to the knowledge of the use of archery for warlike or hunting purpose by the mainland population. Archers may be associated with a fighting troop, but are always less numerous. This minority can also be observed in the graves, and this for the whole Mycenaean period, uh, because I observe more tomb containing weapons without our red than with. The question then arises as to the function of these arrowheads deposit in the graves. In the case of circle B, they do not seem to have been hafted, but rather collected in a ceramic or organic container that has not disappeared. The case of Gray 4 is more complicated since Heinrich Schliemann proposes both a container such as a bag or a quiver. This idea of a quiver is supported by the hypothesis of Axel Persson, who sees in an ornament a potential quiver decoration. He compared it with two Egyptian quivers from a contemporary grave. My study opened the discussion to the rest of the archer's panoply and the difficulty to identify an equipment composed in great majority of organic materials. The importance of the bow, but also of the shafts and the feathering is known from both archaeological and ethnographic examples and must therefore be questioned concerning the Mycenaean period. On the other hand, the arrowheads may have been a representation of the whole set or may have corresponded to the part associated with a particular value by the Mycenaean population. These projectile points testify to the continuity of a napping tradition attested in the region long before the emergence of the Mycenaean culture. From Middle Eladic III to Late Eladic I onwards, the investment in their production has increased. The question then arises as to the role of these arrowheads and their potential presence as an object of display, or at least of representation of a particular practice. Their rare association with the dead, as well as the fascination for weaponry and the importance that is shown in the chef's graves, makes me propose that they are a witness to a particular practice, that of archery. From then on, the individuals buried with these technically over-invested arrowheads could have been recognized and honored by the living as archers at the time of their burial. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Adesaya. And now we are moving to our last speaker, Mariana Negro, who is here. She will present. Mariana is a PhD candidate at the University of Cambridge, and she will present us the dispersal of Etruscan body bronze figurines around the world, a reassemblage of the museum collections to shed light on the human object Okay. <laughs> um, thank you um, for the presentation. Thank you for the organizer. Um, so today my paper will deal with the dispersal of the Cambrian figurines um, in the world in order to um, reassemble them. 
um, and shed light on the Yamal, not just relationship, but particularly on colonialism and how colonial ideology affected their lives. So this is just a brief overview of my presentation. And the first part, I will introduce uh, the figurines and the background of, to the research, the aims and the methodology. And then I will introduce my case studies in the second part, which has the British Museum and the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, talking also about how the world is parcel of the figurines. Finally, in the third part, I will talk about the patterns in the ways the figurines were collected and some concluding remarks. So, um, <laughs> um, the figurines are created through the um, lost wax casting technique, um, and they can vary pretty much uh, in size, shape, style, and subject, but usually they are considered votive because they um, portray praying humans and they're found in large quantities in what are considered to be deposits. For example, I think around like 200 of them were found in Monte Falterona. Um, they're mostly found around Italy, um, but also in other parts of the Mediterranean during the 17th and 18th century. And then they get dispersed because they are bought uh, by aristocrats and then dispersed. They are usually defined either as pre Roman or Etruscans, but actually they're not Etruscans, they're like Italic, because some other Italic population had them as well, like the Umbrians. So they're not, it's not completely correct to them Etruscans, um, even if I did in my title. And they're mostly distinguished between a schematic type and a um, um, more elaborate type or realistic type. So the schematic type is the one on the left. That example is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And that is usually around five centimeters tall. Um, and it's very schematic, while the realistic type is usually 10 centimeters and is um, way more animated um, and elaborate in the a scalp sculpture, and that example is in the British Museum. Yes, okay, thanks. Um, so to for this paper, I will consider the collections as an assemblage, a material and separate assemblage, and one look at the figurines in their singularity, um, but to look at how the figurines all together form a, form a social assemblage. And if collections are assemblages, then the reassemblage of the collection um, can be used to recontextualize and decolonize archaeology, so recontextualize the way in which um, these archaeological objects were collected all together and according to colonial ideology. So if we look at collections and colonialism, um, the practice of collecting is usually uh, considered as a source of colonial knowledge, and in turn, it becomes an instrument of colonial power because um, it's a source of colonial knowledge. So if we consider um, knowledge as power, like for both sides, then it also becomes colonial power. And then I think most important point is that there is a par parallelism that is created between pre-Roman objects, like these type figurines, and uh, modern colonized societies and their ethnographic objects. So that's why it's also important to decolonize ancient colonialism and ancient archaeology. Okay. So the objective of my research was to uncover the reasons the figurines were dispersed in so many institutions around the world and uh, uh, see how they have been looked uh, during their lives and their collection history. So the main two questions are how did they spread and how did the characteristic of the dispersal relate to colonial ideology of this work. So. <laughs> um, so this was actually conducted during COVID, but uh, the methodology was mostly based on archive research online, and I used for the main case studies the online collections, we, um, which I can consider quite reliable, for the Bat collection and the British Museum one. Um, and then I created a database for each figurines um, I found information of, and um, according to the description of the figurines carried out that analysis and see how it was described during the year, so in the first catalog, second and third and whatever, and then create a distribution maps to see how they're dispersed around the world. As I was mentioning before, the case studies are the British Museum in London and the Metropolitan Museum Art in New York. So starting from the British Museum, there's a brief timeline of how the collection was created. So it was started in 1772 with uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, Sir Henry Stoker's collection and 26 figurines were acquired. Then in 1824, um, 29 figures were requested by Payne Wright, and then so on. It's mostly about uh, bequest and acquisition until 2001, until uh, when the last figurines was purchased. Um, 
so it's kind of varied. But um, currently there are 178 Etruscan or Italic figurines in the British Museum, and that's the biggest collection around the world, even in Italy. Um, so in the first catalog, which was written in 1899, they were divided into primitive, archaic, fine spirit, and late bronze figurines. Um, the primitive figurines are usually the ones that are schematic figurines. So it refers to the bronzes that don't have any great influence. Um, so that's not uh, that's based on an art historical approach rather than a chronological approach. Um, also, the current description in the online database right now always mentions Greek influence for what are considered to be the finest period of the late bronzes, and uh, this is uh, most of the figurines in the British Museum because only 55 um, were uh, primitive uh, figurines and 51 out of these 55 are actually missing from the line collections right now. So um, they were in the first catalog. And I don't think, we don't think they were sold by the British Museum. We still think they are in the British Museum. They just got lost in the process, in the database. So they are probably lost somewhere in the storage of the British Museum. Um, so these are some examples of how what are considered to be the finest figurines. So there is the ones are described um, on the modern contemporary light online collection. So there's always some reference to um, Greek sculpture and classical sculpture. For example, um, I really like the description of the figurines on the bottom right that says she's trying to be as refined as Greek girls of the period, <laughs> meaning Greek um, girls sculpted of the period. Uh, but there's also mention of a clear understanding of Greek sculpture by the sculptor and the balance pose and the symmetrical feature, fine example of classical style, etc. Um, so there's always this idea of the Italian sculpture trying to imitate British sculpture and sometimes failing. Moving to the second case study, this is, uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The, the way the collection was created in this case is quite different because um, the museum was funded in the late 1800s. So in 1886, there was the first purchase of the collection. This is the Florence collection. There was an already formed collection, 61 figurines, although there are only 36 right now. Um, and this was done because the museum wanted to create a collection, a large collection as soon as possible. So this is like, I think two years or one year after the museum was funded. Um, and they started already with this big purchase. And that's, um, as you can see, it was basically most of the collection. And then um, in 1996, that was the last purchase of only one figurine. Um, so there are currently 92 figurines and one, six, one third of the figurines is thematic, so quite a lot compared to the British Museum. But as I was saying, this is because um, the, muse the museum purchased the Florence collection, which was an ready-made collection from Italy, and this was mostly schematic. So that's why there are uh, so many schematic figurines um, right now. Um, but the schematic figurines are still defined as having no artistic value. So that is a quote from the first catalog of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it says that the statues are classed together, are or more or less of a crude worm crumb shape and have no artistic value. They're interesting, however, from an archaeological point of view, as they probably represent the common body of frames of the poorer classes who naturally had to have their present cheap. So <laughs> um, I feel like the figurines, uh, the schematic figurines are clearly there just because the museum wanted to create a collection and bought this collection without choosing singularly the figurines. Um, and these were mostly schematic. Um, even in this case, the uh, refined or artistic figurines are seen mainly as copy of Greek sculpture. And the 26 out of the 54 schematic figurines were actually, in this case, sold in an auction. So in this case, not like in the British Museum, there is evidence that the figurines were sold by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. They got rid um, of half, kind of half of the schematic figurines. Um, so this is the same slide as before, but for the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So these are the naturalistic figurines and the way they are described in the contemporary like collection. And again, there's always this idea of imitating Greek sculpture. So for example, the first one says that the stance and the hairstyle how much to the Greek sculpture by Polycletus. And this is also a very hard historical approach because um, Polycletus is something that is usually mentioned by art historian as a Greek sculpture. Um, 
and also the uh, artist was clearly inspired by archaic Greek Kore and it's based on Greek pro prototypes, etc. So um, also there's the mention that the ultimate source of inspiration for the is a series of Greek um, sculpted Kore. So there's this idea again of the Italians trying to imitate Greek sculptures. Um, but also in this case, there's the idea they're trying to imitate but failing because the figurine in the middle mentioned that the artist was clearly inspired by Kai Greek Kore, however, the Greek emission is misrepresented. Um, um, so this is how the figurines are dispersed right now in the world. So as I was saying before, uh, the Mbikas collection is in the British Museum, but actually quite a lot of them made the way to the US. Um, and there's a lot in, most of them are still in Europe though, and there's a lot in around the small villages and towns in France or Germany, quite a lot in the UK as well. Italy is not represented in this map. There's a lot in Italy as well, <laughs> um, but uh, Italy was just covered. And Italy is mostly made of small groups of schematic figurines in small museums. There's no big collections, it's just um, all over Italy. So these are the main patterns on the world dispersal. Uh, the biggest collections are the British Museum, the Metropolitan Museum of Art that I mentioned, and the Louvre that has 130 figurines. Um, the schematic figurines, with the exception of the Met, which I was mentioning before, are usually preserved either in Italy or English academic museums. So um, the uh, Pitt River Museum in Oxford and the Fitzgerald Museum in Cambridge as a few schematic figurines because they were excavated by the universities. Um, and then in the rest of the world, apart from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, they're mostly just naturalistic figurines. Um, also the figurines that spread around France and Germany in villages, um, they were spread because um, aristocrats would buy them, then move back to their town and then donate them to their town or the museums of their town, etc. So they're just spread, they spread like that. Um, um, another point to make is that they can't spread anymore if they are found in Italy, because according to the decree of 2004, uh, objects that are found or excavated in Italy have to be acquired by museums or sold in Italy. So they can't leave Italy anymore. So to conclude, I made three main points of how the figurines are spread and collected around the world. The first point is Hellenization and Romanization. That's because um, the figurines, especially the ones that are considered more valuable, so naturalistic, are always seen in terms of Hellenization or imitating Greek and for the late Bronze Roman as well, um, sculpture. And in this case, the cultural change that happens with the um, contact between Italians, Etruscans, and Greek is seen as imitation and acculturation rather than hybridization. And the variation are considered as mistakes other than choices. So there's no agency from um, the Italic populations. Um, the second point I wanted to make that I mentioned as well before is the art, art historical approach. So the figurines are classified based on a development of style, which culminates with Greek imitation rather than according to the chronology or the context. For example, uh, most of the schematic figurines are found in the same context, um, which is quite interesting because they're all votive deposits, but they are taken away from this context even in the, um, um, in, the, in the catalogs. So there's no mention of where they were found. And so the figurines are decontextualized from an archeological point of view and just seen in terms of an art historical approach. And then lastly, the dismissal of schematic figurines, which are only present in academic museums or in Italy or in the map because of um, how the collection was created. And these also are uh, regarded as lacking aesthetic value and they become symbol of primitivism, which could be considered a legitimization to, of Hellenization and Romanization, so legitimization of colonialism, and which is why I was mentioning before, there is a parallelism between modern colonized society, their ethnographic objects and um, old colonized society, so the Etruscans, the Umbrians, um, and other Italian populations. So this is my conclusions. Um, there is, I think, through the reassemblage of the figurines, uh, the idea of a narrative of acculturation through, that is created through the figurines. Um, also the colonial ideology dictates the life of the figurines because it dictates where they are collected and how they are collected and how they are described. <laughs> 
and there is this colonial dichotomy between civilization and primitivism, which is um, visible in the dichotomy between schematic and materialistic figurines. So moving on, I think that we need to consider that the colonization of museum should also include the ancient artifacts. So we shouldn't just focus on the modern ethnographic objects, which are, for example, present in the British Museum nowadays, but also on how the British Museum, for example, uh, presents these ancient objects um, and how they can portray colonialism as well. Um, also challenge this narrative of acculturation, which has already been challenged by the academic literature, um, challenge the art historical approach, and then give agency to this Italic publisher that created the figurines. Um, that is all. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. The speakers are here. If you can unmute yourself and we start the Q&A session. And let's start from our first presentation, Amy Ferguson. Are there any questions about uh, the topic of Amy or the Pochatis uh, three model? Amy, are you here? Yeah, I'm here. Yes. If you want to open your camera also. Yes. Any questions? No. Any questions in the chat? No. I was curious, Amy, if there are any parallels in the archaeological record for uh, the Cochatis uh, model. Uh, sorry, one second. The question was if there are any parallels for the Cochatis. Uh... Uh, yes, yeah, so there's two other models that have the same structure. Um, but in terms of where we can see this kind of structure represented in the archaeological record, we see it a lot in, not a lot, but we see it in funerary architecture. So in Marquis, there's a, uh, I think it's tomb 66 or something. It's mentioned by Webb and Frankel in the article that I referenced. There's a female figure carved into the tomb wall that looks similar to the figure on the model. And as well as this, at the same tomb, there's also pilasters carved into the rock as well, which again, looks very sim uh, similar to the three pilasters on the back panel of the Kachatis model. And the two other shrine models that look similar to the Kachatis model, unfortunately don't have the same level of detail. They're much smoother in their overall appearance. So the kind of structural composition isn't as clear or as noticeable, which is why I haven't included them in the object analysis directly. But there are other models similar to this, and again, they have no clear provenance. Similar to the Kishati model, we don't know where they came from, but it's interesting that there's just these three models that all look very similar to each other. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers <laughs> the question. And about the Bukrania you suggested, are there any parallels? How often do we see in the early Cypriot uh, context, uh, Ukraine, or early or middle, as you refer to the society? Uh, so I think it's interesting that we have these depictions of Ukraine. Um, you know, it follows on from the reintroduction of cattle onto the island, and it kind of becomes this huge part of the artistic identity on the North Coast in the early Bronze Age, but not so much on the rest of the island as um, on the kind of Southern parts of the island, we don't see it as frequently and um, this kind of bull iconography, but it comes from the, it's like coming from the North Coast and it's very frequent. Daisy Knox points it out in her PhD. You know, this is, there's a heavy bias towards specifically cattle over any other animal as well. And, 
then throughout the subsequent subsequent Bronze Age, it kind of just gets stronger and stronger and spreads more across the island. And so what I find interesting here is that we have kind of a, the more simplistic forms of bulls and cattle and Ukraina in general. And then they get more and more kind of complex um, later on in the Bronze Age. And in the late Bronze Age, you also get this kind of crossing of materials as well. So it's not, they're not just exclusively being made in clay anymore. They're starting to um, incorporate metal into these uh, depictions. So with metal rings going through the balls, like in their nose. And also you have like figures like the Enkemi statue, which is entirely made out of metal, but he's got this helmet on with the bull horns. And I think like because we don't know or there's no written sources for what these bull horns might have symbolized or meant, I think it's naive to think that this didn't represent something or mean something to the community and shouldn't necessarily be taken just as a depiction of an animal. I think there's something more um, esoteric going on there with the, with the use of it. And, you know, I think we can see that here developing in the early Bronze Age. So that's why I find this model particularly interesting. It's because you have the two bull-headed figures that are, you know, look like bulls, cattle, but then you have this one on the left that's different. And, you know, why is it different? And um, again, in the literature, this isn't really touched upon. Nobody's questioning why it's different or what species it possibly was. So yeah, that's something that I wish to look into further. Thank you, thank you. Good luck, good luck with your research. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's, are there any other questions of the, the chat? No. So, okay, let's move to Elizabeth Stefani's presentation. Elizabeth, are you here? Yes, I am. Yes. Are there any questions? Yes, Monica. Would you like to come here, Monica, please? Or we have a microphone? No, no. Monica, thank you. Elizabeth, open your camera. Yes, I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for your overview about the necropolis of Amathus. And I am very interested in the tools that uh, you documented the coexistence with the practice of inhumation and cremation. Mm -hmm. I understand correctly, there are only seven and they are from Cypro classical and also Hellenistic. You can elaborate a little bit more because I think it's really interesting that you find the two practices in the same tomb. Yes, these tombs are even less than seven. The seven were, I think, the, um, the six graves I was referring to. The, I think only three, only three or four tombs, we have the coexistence of inhumation with cremation inside an amphora and in one case, especially, the amphora was placed right next to the one inhumated disease. So it was in direct connection with the skeletal. So the one body was inhumated and the other one was cremated, put aside in uh, an amphora next to the inhumated disease. I'm not sure. I think we're, we have at least three cases of this, of, of this, yes. Mm -hmm. Some, uh, anthropological studies about these remains or is it no unfortunately as far as i know i'm not sure if somebody was looking at this material i think yeah i think one girl was studying the yes, cremated yes, bones yes, from amathus yes the phd student from the university so, from the cyprus institute right yes yes yes, yes. so we i think we both uh, yeah i think we refer to the same person and uh, bianca bianca right i think yes. that's her so I think, she, yes, because lately she was studying the material, the cremated bones, and these bones were included in her uh, research. So hopefully we'll know more about it. But this is a Hellenistic one. No, the, okay. I think it was cyproclassical. Wow. The amphora, at least, which the cremated bones were found into uh, from the cyproclassical period. Well, very interesting. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Let's see in the chat, just a moment. No, no. I, I would like to ask you, Elizabeth, about the sister graves. Mm -hmm. The can mnimata, you, that's what they refer to. Yes, can you tell us a bit uh, more? Because well, identify, unknown to, 
to the scholarly literature. It was not that clear. Well, I have to admit that they are unknown because they have not been registered. The fact that I encountered them was, I think it was on the last phases of uh, concluding my remarks for my PhD thesis. And by chance, I found some plants of the Eastern Necropolis. And there I saw some tombs that looked like a box. And then I found also some sections and I realized that these tombs are actually cyst graves. And some of them, when I visited the Eastern Necropolis, were still there. I mean, they were, we don't even know who excavated them because at a certain point, the Necropolis was being excavated every year. And um, we don't have any documentation because its tombs were never registered with a number. So that's why they were never referred to any bibliography. And we know them also from the British. The British uh, refer very often to Mnimata and they call them Nimada. And on the notebook of Smith and Myers, who both excavated on the Eastern Necropolis, uh, I counted, I think, more than 20 of them. Okay. So they refer to these cyst graves as Mnimata, and they were covered with slabs. And what are exactly the date uh, range? Uh, mm. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know because I have no material. I, I don't have any material. I mean, there was nothing inside of uh, registered because since the tomb was never registered, we don't have we don't know what was found inside it. But on the plan, on the same the very same plan that I found on the Department of Antiquities, there was one skeleton lying in C two, and there was one. Uh, I think it was a mouthpiece on the skeleton on the cranium. Okay. I'm not sure about that. It needs more investigation. But yes, it is truly interesting because, as I told you, nobody really excavated them properly. Okay. And it's easy to miss them because they are not underground chamber tombs. They are just cyst uh, graves and it, they, cannot, or they can easily be uh, misunderstood for a, a basin. For example, if they have no skeletal remains, and they're being excavated in the burial ground. No, it's not sure if this is a grave or not. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> no, I think. Thank you. Move to the next speaker, yes. And uh, uh, Odysseus, if you can open your camera, yes. Are there any questions for Odysseus? Yes. If you can come, please. Hi, Dithias. Um, so I have two questions for you. Um, you said that you did experimentation with Frederick. And so, um, because you said that it was quite a demanding work, uh, very hard to do, I was wondering how much time it took, I mean, him and I don't remember the other uh, name of Lithician, but how long it took them to, to make one um, arrowhead. And my second question is that um, since you did the um, macro traces analysis and that you've also did tribology, I was wondering if you managed to find use word um, traces, use word evidence on the arrowhead that would um, enable you to say um, if uh, those arrowheads are only um, uh, here for the prestige of uh, the, the person who was uh, buried there or if there was, um, you know, uh, uh, reuse. Uh, so I'll start with the experimentation. Um, I, I I don't think we can measure the time uh, spent for uh, making an arrow. Um, Frédéric or uh, so Frédéric Abes or uh, Jérémy Vosges spend not a lot of time to uh, to make an arrow. Um, I. I don't register it, but um, for example, uh, Jeremy spent, I think, two two hours to to make three arrows, uh, arrowheads. But um, I think we can consider it uh, a little bit differently. Um, for example, Jeremy, Jeremy uh, produced arrowheads during the whole year. Um, and um, he he used sequence for for this. He separated the the phase of production, um, and I, I think it's a, it's it's a good thing to study. He he, he made our red in four times, I think, 
uh, a, a part when he can nap outside. And during winter, he just finished the hour head, uh, but, but inside this time. So I, it, it don't take a lot of time if you know how to, to do this. Okay. Uh, I think I answer your question. Or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the second question of uh, about use where uh, analysis um, for the the arrowheads from shaft graves, and I think for uh, a lot of other funerary context, uh, they are not used. I don't find any trace that can show a use. There is no. Uh, impact or or you things like that. Um, you don't find but, anything on, on the silicon uh, molds, nor on, on tribology. No, 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 no. There, there is nothing. But it's not a surprise for me because um, the, I, I think my senior decide to to put those arrowheads in the graves um, without using it because if you use a stone arrowhead. Um, you take the risk that they are uh, totally break uh, after that. So I think it, it's good to see that they are not used. It's, it's something, it's a result. But um, it's the reason why I want to study other contexts, uh, uh, spatial contexts or uh, arrays from villages to, to see if sometimes they use it. The second part of use where analysis is the the afting uh, trace, um, and for this uh, I don't have the I, I I don't try to find it for now, but I I, I will and may, maybe we will see. But uh, for now, I don't know. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi, Elisa. Uh, okay. I really enjoyed your presentation. It's very exciting to search for actress in general. Um, actually, the second part was going to be my main question. I was. I think you alluded to that in your talk, but I was wondering explicitly about the Wehrmax. So my other question is, um, uh, these stone ones were beautifully carved and I'm wondering, is it common to find stone arrowheads during a period where the metals prevail and uh, whether that would enhance your theory or proposal that these were markers for this specific class, which I'm guessing relates to social status. Uh, th thank you for your question. Uh, I, I think the use of uh, lithic uh, tools are underestimated for Bronze Age uh, most of the time. Um, and but, but already in his, uh, are a particular tools, uh, I think easily recognize, recognizable. So I, I, I think it, it's a question that uh, I have to, 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 to study. So now what I can say is that we are an increase of the production of uh, arrowheads in stone uh, at the end of the Middle Bronze Age in Greece, even if we already have uh, bronze arrowheads uh, in some uh, archaeological set. Um, so I, I think it, in, a, in a way it's uh, a maintain of a tradition, as I said, um, and I think for arrowheads, it's something important to consider with, but it might be also something that is used by the population. Uh, and I don't know for now if, it, if it's used when people can't uh, acquire maybe um, uh, bronze or copper at least. Um, but I, I, I think it's not uh, a surprise to see that there are a co uh, coexistence between those two materials at that time. Thank you. 
Thank you, Lucia. Any other questions on the archers? Okay. So I will move to our last uh, speaker. Thank you, Lucia. Thank you. And where is Mariana? If you want to come to the podium. Are there any questions here? Yes. So maybe you too, you will have to, I don't know, for the public. Uh, actually, it's more a comment rather than a question. Uh, I'm also dealing with the technology of the valid Ethiopian question. And this pattern of civilized and savage is uh, runs through the whole display, governance, labeling, and so on and so forth. I haven't thought before that this pattern also applies to, let's say, an earlier. Um, uh, objects and of your theology. Uh, and the second comment is about the uh, Italian thing. There have been some cases for the European political rights, recognizing that Italy has sovereign rights to prohibit the export of national treasures. Do I have to get that? <laughs> no, if you want to open the discussion, so okay. just to say you Yes, okay. Then, you know, I do um, find the fact that it is visible in uh, earlier phases very interesting as well. And usually people don't think about that because it's not as obvious. Um, but that's why I think it's so important to think about it too, because there's a parallelism that's created, um, especially because um, Western heritage, well, Western civilization thinks that it comes from Western heritage, and because Western civilization is based on Roman and Greek civilization, then they also have uh, the legit legitimization of a, um, other type of primitivism. Um, so, and they are very well connected, and uh, I find that very interesting. But like, there is colonization in the West as well in the ancient civilizations. Um, that is usually is even more difficult to consider that as colonization. Because it's, um, it's difficult for Italians, for example, to think that Italy was once colonized by the Romans. It wasn't Roman. So, I, yeah, I, I found that, yeah. Can I, uh, can I add something else? Yes. I, I don't know whether you have in mind the book of uh, Smith, Uses of Heritage, yes. and the authorized heritage discourse, and how it excludes marginal voices uh, and it's not uh, allowed them to express in the covenant history in the late. No, yes, I, I did use that as well um, in my dissertation. But uh, also, I, there's another part that's about exhibition and narratives, representation, and how the narrative is an uh, authorized heritage narrative. Yes. Please, please. Uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, about the how these objects are represented in Italian collections. How does this compare? Especially the, as you said, the primitive and then naturalist. How are they treated in Italian museum collections, and how does that compare to how they are treated in the British Museum? Okay, so um, generally, oh, okay. So the question was um, how does the Italian collections deal with the figurines compared to the international collections? So generally, if it is in a national museum, they are treated the same as the British Museum or the Met, um, but more like local museums, um, regional museum and civic museum um, deal with them very differently because they contextualize them very well. So they are collected from the place where they are displayed and they are um, displayed from figurines as actually a celebration of their culture. Um, so that's the only difference. If, if they are um, displayed um, and collected in the place where they were found and excavated, it's usually very different. But if they are, for example, in the museums in Rome, it's pretty much the same. So they're just displayed like in the British Museum. And, and the rhetoric about connections with Greek sculpture, is it, is it there as well or not? It is, especially in the south part of Italy. So, um, what used to be Mania Grecia, they are still, still very much connected to the rhetoric about Greek um, 
Hellenization or Greek culture. Yes. But, but that's not a part of the in colonial it, uh, necessarily compared to art. It's something else or not? Um, I do find that in the south of Italy, they tend to challenge romanization by going on to Hellenization. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, I don't think I okay. Uh, sorry, uh, so, so the question was if can be sure to the um all the figurines are original because there have been some controversies. Um no. <laughs> so yeah, so I personally cannot be sure, but also the museum is scanned. So also because the records are really old and the curators now deal with the old records and they just um go for what the records say. And most of the time the records lie, so they say they bought them from some dealers and they were stolen um or just probably created but like there's nothing we can do about that i mean if they are fabricated they wouldn't be if they're so clearly fabricated, they wouldn't be displayed. They would just be in the storage. I and mean, then most of them are just in the storage and they haven't been looked at for ages. They're just in the catalog. Yeah. Yeah. They wouldn't, but honestly, most of them are just in the storage and forgotten there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, so in the case, oh, the question was, sorry, <laughs> if uh, we have any idea of um, the original location of the figurines. Um, so if we are not talking about Italy, in most cases, there's just purchased by or donated by. Um, in some cases, especially in the British Museum, they were purchased by dealers after excavations. So there's some locations uh, of big excavations or uh, um, big finds, but that's not most cases. And also they are mentioned, but not contextualized. Like that's not the main uh, point for the museum, for the catalogs. Yeah, but we do have some records of them. Yeah, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mariana. Thank you all, all the speakers, congratulations for the nice and interesting presentation. And now uh, it, it will follow a short uh, coffee break of 15 minutes, and then we will have the final and closing session of the conference today. Thank you all.